render as soon as it starts. There we go. All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, your Apostle Paul invited us to pray and also prayed for us that we would be filled with the knowledge of your will and that we would have that uh, knowledge through insight and wisdom that comes from your spirit. And that is what we need to be a part of the journey that your scripture invites us on. And so we ask that not only would we hear your word, but we would follow you and act in a way that shows um, that Christ is in us and working through us. And so help us to grow in that good work as we grow in you. And so we begin this time in Jesus' name. Amen. That's from uh, the first, went right back to the first chapter of Colossians, and that's from verses 9 through 11. And Paul's uh, words, his encouragement, his, pro his promises of God that he repeats uh, for our sake, um, our, our prayers also that, uh, that we'll grow into those. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start my, let's see, that's not the way I need to do it, though. I need to go here. And there we go. Still getting to hang of it a little bit. So this is our uh, final session. Um, we're going to be kind of just bringing together some closing thoughts and looking forward. Um, you know, anytime we make a journey through scripture or a journey through a theme, um, my hope, of course, as a pastor, you know, it, it's not necessarily my, my hope for every sermon, but when we study a particular book and we study it for six weeks in a row, is that it does have an effect on us. It, it changes uh, some of our perceptions or it invites us to continue working on it, growing in our knowledge so that, um, you know, this time is well spent. So that's why a little bit tougher, I guess, uh, a little bit maybe longer uh, feedback from this uh, last uh, form, uh, just to kind of take our time together and make it, make it go past where we are now, not just a head knowledge thing, but a, take it into action. And um, so the first thing I wanted to do then was to back up just a little bit. Um, let me go back to the section of uh, Corinthians or Colossians into the second chapter. The second chapter is a place I've visited quite a few times. Um, pastorally speaking, I visited there a lot. Uh, it's, it's odd. Um, when we started discussing that section, um, I really didn't have as much uh, time to spend at, um, at this second, at second chapter. So if you want to have your Bibles open to second chapter of Colossians, because um, throughout my ministry, uh, one of the things that I've come across, maybe it's because of being in the Northwest, uh, maybe it was because of the situations that um, are the churches I served were in, but oftentimes uh, couples would find a happy medium in Lutheranism, um, whether that be from a, like a Catholic or Episcopal tradition, uh, with a Baptist or Methodist or evangelical on the other side of the marriage, it seems like Lutheranism kind of became that nice middle point because we're not really Protestants. We're obviously not Catholic. Uh, and so we really we kind of fall in this weird kind of middle ground all the time. And so oftentimes I was uh, talking with couples and one of the first questions that the evangelical or Baptist struggled with was the Lutheran understanding of baptism, right? And so my journey has taken me back to uh, Colossians chapter two, verse 11, quite often. And we really didn't talk about it in our first pass through uh, because Paul uh, puts together a deep theological topic with one that has uh, been part of the division of the Christian church um, you know, post, uh, post Christ. Uh, and I would say for the most part, maybe more relatively new, uh, in the last hundred years or so. So I would, I want to just, uh, touch on that just a little bit, not, uh, not incredibly deeply, but just to kind of put the signpost there in chapter two, verse 11, because what Paul does here is he puts together 
two big concepts, circumcision and baptism. And um, there's a couple of pretty powerful pictures that that gives right away to the topic. Uh, the first is, of course, that uh, circumcision was for the male part, male community, right? Male parts of the community. They, uh, on the eighth day, usually after birth, they would have, you know, their foreskin removed, and that was a sign of being a part of the covenantal community. And um, so, oddly, uh, that promise was reflected in, in the male part of the community. Now, uh, baptism, of course, right from the start, as part of a sign of being in the kingdom of God, um, that was never reserved just for the male part of the community. It was everybody. Everybody's part of that. Um, so this, this picture here is one that already shows that there's something that's changed, and yet there is still this connection. And I think that it's important to recognize that circumcision almost uh, always was not some kind of a decision, right? A conscientious uh, individual or individualistic decision, um, which certainly runs counter to a lot of the um, evangelical tradition um, or the Arminian tradition, which says, you know, make a choice, you know, choose, choose, choose the Lord, uh, choose him in a, a decision that you can mark the day and time. And, and, uh, and so I think that Paul wants us to know that this is something that God is doing, that he brings us into this community. And it's something that we can look at as strong, having a good foundation uh, that we give glory to God for that um, is, is a powerful picture of what uh, baptism means. And so I've, I've, I've come to this verse uh, many times as a part of that conversation. It's not, certainly not, you know, it's not your, your best or final, and I don't proof text, I hate proof texting. It's like, here, here's a verse, proved it, and now let's move on to your next issue or problem, right? But it would certainly need to be part of the conversation. And so that's why I think uh, 211 for me was one I wanted to re, uh, re, re, uh, revisit because I've, I've been visiting it throughout my ministry. Um, so here's why I think it matters. Uh, it's, it's a place I, do, I work with a lot of Baptists. Um, a lot of people that are working with me on the teen center are from, you know, foothills. Um, and throughout my, throughout my ministry, uh, that's been the case. I think what I struggle with the most is both their sense of uh, a, uh, when did you make a decision for Christ? Very becomes a very central question, right? And we could say, I could say, March twenty seventh, nineteen seventy one, right? That was the day of my baptism. Um, but you could also say every day. Right, I think it's probably more precise, uh, at least in Lutheran theology, to say every day. Right, every day we need to drown the old Adam. Every day we rise again, as uh, remade, uh, reinvigorated, uh, led by Jesus, because that's that's really what our lives are about. It's about this. Remember, we talked about that prayer picture from last week, where that person kept kept getting up and down, and that's really a good picture for our our lives. That's um, a good picture for not the Methodist picture where we're perfecting, we're getting a little bit better, 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 and we should be, if we aren't, then you know, maybe we have a problem with our faith. Or um, a, a Baptist picture with, to, which to me always just had this uncomfortable sense of kind of a divided glory. I chose Jesus on this day, and it, it, it always seems more powerfully founded in something greater than ourselves, if we say God, God chose us, or God promised that He would be with me from that point on, or God, uh, God claimed me right out of my sin and out of my slavery, God claimed me. Um, to me, that is a much more powerful place to stand, and I love my Baptist brothers and sisters, um, and I know that they highly value the Word of God. Just, just like we do. Um, so it, it has certainly not been um, the place where our relationship ended or exploded or anything like that. But occasionally there were times um, with couples where 
it was a barrier to them um, worshiping with us. So it, it can it can divide. Um, so I, I just wanted to revisit that because I feel like it was um, maybe once something that has been important to me pastorally through my past in pastoral ministry. Uh, this one here is going to be probably one I want to spend a little more time on. Oh, I guess as always, I did have some artwork there, uh, but nothing, uh, nothing too. Uh, this is a picture of Jesus raising Jairus's daughter, and um, and certainly the picture that uh, Paul gives us of what baptism is about: being raised to new life. Um, you know, if 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 a uh, if an example of circumcision. You know, isn't um, isn't powerful enough? I guess I would say, to say this is about God's actions for our sake. Then uh, the picture of being resurrected uh, from through the tomb that Christ has gone through for us and resurrected us to life should also say something about the fact that, you know, as a dead body, not not making a lot of choices. Um, so I'll get off my uh, soapbox for now. And hopefully move on, but I, I really would like to say where where is where's our where's our most powerful place to stand, and it's where God has placed us in grace, uh, by gift. Okay, now for the one that I think is going to take a little bit more time, um, challenging. Um, so this one here, I just want to unpack a little bit more because this probably was the most challenging topic because of the timeliness of the issue. And the first thing I want to do is just talk about um, the fact that we're called to. You become a new person, right? Uh, this new person is continually renewed in knowledge to be like its creator, right? That's Colossians 3, verse 10. And with that in mind, you know, we are, are we are learners, all of us. And um, I, I, uh, I, I really like some of the research I did on this. One of them was to see some of the statements made by John Nunes. Um, he's He's the president of Bronxville, New York, uh, Concordia, Bronxville. And he, uh, one of the first things he said, which totally got me right there in that verse too, is, is he, he gets his, his students to tap themselves on the shoulders. And he just says, I don't know everything, right? And so tapping yourself six times, I don't know everything, right? And that, um, it, it, it was just a cool way of saying, you know, we're still learning and nobody has the whole picture nobody has the whole um, of the subject and you know for having a college professor who's also president of the college that he does that too so he's able to say we don't know everything and this this is definitely a topic that's worthy of your time of digging into but I want to talk about some just some common ground some of the places where I've been since our discussion of that and then just an encouragement to you so some of the common grounds that I think are important to do is to talk about, first of all, scripture, right? And that scripture in the big picture doesn't really talk about race, right? This is kind of a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's absent from history, but if we want to make, a, 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 if we want to make, create our lexicon based on how the Bible does race, it doesn't really work that way it'll talk talk about tribe right it'll talk about people with the same languages but race isn't really a biblical concept right it's it's a division that's been made uh, by us right and we've certainly been really good at talking about our differences but it's not a division that's made in scripture um, it's usually divisions made by language like i said or uh, divisions made by beliefs right um, but if you can picture the people who had been gathered there at the Pentecost, they would have been people of all races, but really the only conversation that's talked about there are believers in Christ and the Jewish people there for the past the Passover or the Pentecost festival, right? And they might have talked where they were from, but there's not that discussion of, of race again. So uh, we keep in mind that, uh, you know, in a an apocalyptic sense too uh, what god uh, what god is doing is you know drawing us all to be with him and communion with him um it's not there's not once again in this apocalyptic or forward-looking aspect really a, a concept of race um 
Now that said, so that's one common ground that we should start with, at least in terms of scripture, that's what we, you know, where we start with, uh, that that's, that's not a central importance to God, but sin is, right? And racism does exist, right? Um, it was certainly tough to listen to some of his uh, presentations because his own son, you know, has suffered through profiling um, the, the privilege that, uh, that, he, that even the president has en uh, enjoyed. He said, he, 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 was, he, was, he made it clear to say that he does believe privilege exists, he just doesn't think it falls into racial categories. Um, and this is the way he put it, you know, like, like his son, you know, he, um, he was profiled and pulled over by police. And, you know, he, as a president of the, the college and well-known part of the community, a well-regarded, um, you know, made a phone call, talked to the police department and was able to, to work it out and solve it. He's like, that's privilege. I mean, I knew the person to talk to. I was on a good terms with them. Um, I had some reputation to approach that conversation with and I was able to work it out. And so that to me um, was a pretty powerful picture of first of all, recognizing, you know, what, what some people go through all the time um, that, you know, maybe we haven't experienced uh, so much. I don't know. Um, and it's important to keep that uh, in our minds when we also think about the fact that if we do have some level of privilege, what can we do with that? You know, what, what can we do for the sake of the kingdom? And he, that's what he, he would, you know, uh, President Nunes said, you know, this, this is an opportunity for us to use or leverage our privilege for the sake of building up others. You know, something to consider. It's hard to sometimes see what kind of privilege we have. Um, so common ground then, uh, starting with just, uh, is race really an important factor or something scripture felt it needed to talk about? No. Um, does racism exist? Yes. Is racism a sin? Yes, right? Um, God doesn't allow us to apply general truths or stereotypical truths to be applied to a particular skin color, uh, to, to put uh, people into particular categories because it simplifies things. It just, that's just not um, allowed. That's not what it means to be unifying because of the Holy Spirit instead of dividing, right? We came across multiple verses about that in Colossians. Um, finally, uh, kind of in closing, then we've talked about uh, this in Colossians is that all, you know, all have sinned. We all fall into this category, but all have been uh, redeemed. All Christ has died for all people. So we have some really good common ground um, in, in places where we uh, should be able to have a conversation, you know, if we're willing to take it and listen. Um, so, you know, what, where this also led me in my study to prepare for tonight was to look at, you know, what else do we see this talked about in scripture? And one of the places is in Exodus chapter 21, it talks about slavery. And from there, we have really this kind of expansion out from there of this topic. Uh, there's, there's, um, there was a practice in those days that if you were defeated people, you could be enslaved. Um, but that wasn't a practice that was set forward by um, God, right? Um, now that doesn't necessarily make this situation any better because if you want to talk about this in the lens of Joshua, the options were, um, and this was, we can, this is another really hard topic um, when we kind of look at that picture of genocide in, um, in holy war, um, in the lens of jihad nowadays. So that could be a whole Bible study itself. But let me say this, is that there is indications um, that there was an opportunity uh, for the people of Cana, Canaan to, be, um, to repent of who they were, of what they were doing, of the, uh, they were committing uh, child sacrifice um, their gods were based on uh, either pleasure or production, right? And, and God had tried to call them both by putting his people in their midst and also through prophets that we don't necessarily always know the names of um, to repentance. 
so that when it came time for Joshua to come through, it was a time of judgment. And so there was two options. The first option is very less palatable to us uh, in our modern sensibilities, but we could have that conversation all the way through in a different time. And that was um, that they would be devoted to God, right? Which to me puts them in the right hands, you know, in the case of judgment. I mean, this is, if this is going to be the end, what hands do you want to be in? But, and that basically means death, right? Everybody. It's horrible. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine, but the other thing was, the other way was, and there were groups of people who did this or individuals that they could be defeated, right? But that meant joining, they were part of the community. They were brought into the family. And that, and so that's really not, there's not now all of a sudden there's Israelites and then there's the few people who are the slaves. So that's, that's not the picture that scripture gives of that. However, uh, Exodus chapter 21 does talk about another reason for that slavery status. And that would be because of unpaid debt, right? Unpaid debt. Mm. So we didn't really have, there wasn't an economic system that put that, that cost uh, into a loan and it, you know, am amortized over time or whatever. It, it, it was, there was not supposed to be interest, not supposed to be usury. Um, but if you had a debt and you couldn't pay it, then you, then uh, somebody would be enslaved, right? Usually one of your family members, um, like a debtor or a debtor's prison, right? Um, interestingly enough though, and so just to kind of close this section off as I start to expand out into scripture, is that the time limit for slavery um, is six years. And that may sound, you know, uh, like a number that's probably has some meaning to you, um, but, their seventh year, they were to be freed. And that's supposed to happen every seven years. Um, the sad part is we don't know about this ever happening in the history of Israel uh, because the seventh year was called a Jubilee year, right? So every seven years, people would be returned to their land, their debts would be forgiven. Um, there'd be kind of this reset, this leveling again of all people in Israel. It's a powerful, powerful system. Um, that really should have been carried out, but we never have any idea that it was. Um, I can't. I can't imagine. It'd be so, it would be amazing. It would be amazing. Um, so, six years was the maximum, right? And the debt would be forgiven at that point. The person would be set free, unless they found somebody to marry within that household. And <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like, yep, if they get married, then they stay with that household forever. Um, so it's. <laughs> It's, it's tough because we can't apply, we can't retro apply our principles. We have a highly stratified socioeconomically uh, uh, society nowadays with a society that basically had workers and managers and that's what they had all the way up to the time of Samuel. And then all of a sudden they also had a royal class with the palace with those people who cared for the king and all the things the king had to do in terms of army and taxes, blah, 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 which definitely stratified the the society even more, but we have a we have a, some ways of apprehending that worldview. Um, but managers and workers, because nowadays we can come start to understand some modern pictures of slavery. Right, uh, debt debt is one of those pictures. We, you know, it's a uh, what is what is our song that uh, so many days and what do you get another another day what poor and deeper in debt. I'm trying to remember the, the song right now. Um, that, that sense of you're struggling with um, how much debt you may have, you may be, it might be heavy, it may be burdensome, and you're just trying to stay ahead of it, right? Or if it, you have a mortgage, which is uh, one of those kind of tough things to do without going into debt at all, um, that, that would be just another picture of the fact that you, you uh, have a debt that you're constantly beholden to. Um, but nowadays, too, we can see it in contracts. We can see it in, in credit cards with high interest rates, things like that. We see uh, modern slavery also in um, sec the sex trade and human trafficking. Um, and as scripture also reflects, sin and addiction is a type of slavery. So in general, it's a negative concept, almost always, except if God is the master, right? Every other way is um, 
prone to our sinfulness. So that makes it a really dangerous concept to ever. I, I, I just, I can't even, I, I, I cannot, I've, I've, all the places I've looked, everywhere in scripture, would sure make me want to face, you know, a slave owner who's trying to defend slavery based on scripture. But just, I mean, American slavery ha, is so different. It's so apples and oranges for me. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go here. I mean, when you see, when you see uh, tribal warfare in Africa, bringing the losing tribe, you know, to the slavers who put them in horrible, disgusting conditions, and for whoever survives across that sea voyage from Africa to the Americas, then for them to be brought to slave market and sold at auction, it just it doesn't have anything to do with what we're seeing in scripture. I mean, it's just no comparison. So I, I, I think what's been the toughest part about this, uh, this struggle is to be very careful in making any kind of correlation between scripture and a conversation about racism and slavery. Um, to, to live within that verse there that I showed you at the very beginning that we need to continually renew our minds, our understanding to keep them flexible and growing and to be listening in conversation with people, to be continual learners and to be listeners first. And I think there's probably one other aspect to that that we really have to struggle with is that sometimes we need to unlearn some things, right? Um, I'm sure that all of you have had in your life an influence or maybe maybe parents maybe another influence in your life who was who was blatantly racist right and we certainly had certain stereotypes that they would apply to people carte blanche for the color of their skin and that is certainly completely unacceptable um, and so there's times when we have to unlearn a lesson that we've taken right uh, colossians 2 20 says if you have died with christ for the world's way of doing things why don't you let, why do you let others tell you how to live, right? So there's things that we've learned that about how to live, about how to view the world that we've inherited. And it's as though you were still under the world's influence, right? So if you have died with Christ to the way of the world, right, that all changed, changes everything. So we have to continually renew our knowledge, recognize those things we need to unlearn and give them up. So this, this is a, this here is just from a recent article that was that's part of what's called the Lutheran Reporter. And there's an excellent article in there about race and race relations. I commend that to you. Um, if you if you look up the Lutheran Reporter, uh, you'll find it on on the internet and you can find that that uh, that issue on uh, race. So it's worthy worthy of your time. Okay. Uh, if you haven't yet, you might want to stand up, take a little uh, stretch to help us because you can keep keep kind of uh, that blood flowing so you can keep uh, keep listening as you're able to. Um, just want to do a couple quick look backs in the big picture. And that is um, just a, a picture of, um, of what we see in this text that we might might be invisible, especially if you're just kind of like digging into a chapter or you're putting together a theme that like picks up chapters from a bunch of different books. When you look at Colossians in whole, one of the things I think we should see here is really what it takes for the sharing of the gospel and it's teamwork, right? It's relationship, it's teamwork, it's uh, vulnerability, it's uh, sharing, it's praying, um, it's teaching. All these things are, are what what Paul does as a part of his relationship with Colossae, a church he'd probably never been to before. And all the people of his team that were a part of that, and then the rising incidences, the report from Epaphras, the appearance of Onesimus, the slave of Philemon, who became a big part of the conversation and would certainly be one of the ones carrying the letter back to Colossae with Tychicus, right? These are, these are this is a cool uh, web of relationships that it takes uh, to surround uh, people with uh, the gospel. And each one of us are gifted in so many different ways to be a part of that, that connection, that net, that, that web that uh, leads people to understand who Jesus Christ is. 
Um, so apostling to me is that big picture that Paul gives us uh, through the whole book of the connections, uh, the understanding, the teaching, the praying for, uh, the calling back to just simple subjects. It doesn't always have to be a tricky conversation. It doesn't always have to be a, a highbrow conversation with somebody. It could just be saying, what's, what's the basic here, you know? It's the hard stuff. Um, forgiveness, right? Or dealing with a family history or unlearning some kind of a habit that's actually deadly or dangerous to your faith. It's just, it doesn't have to be um, a complicated, deep, and um, brand new understanding because that's what Gnosticism wanted you to believe that you had all these levels you had to climb. And if you get to the very top, you knew the right handshakes and you knew the right angel's name and you knew the right power, then you were more powerful than the people on that level below you. And that's never where Paul wanted to, to land. He didn't want to, he didn't want to be there in that secret kind of society, secret knowledge uh, camp. Um, so that said, uh, how does Paul, um, how does Paul get around meddling, right? For us, uh, we need to know what it means to meddle and what it means to intercede, what it means to care for people, what it means to pray for people, what it means to, to talk with people. I mean, Paul's writing this while he's in prison, um, and he's accomplished something great. We just studied it. We just got through it. Just four chapters, but we, I hope all of us are taking, looks like it, all of us are taking something away from this um, that we're going to, that we're going to take with us. Um, so what do, what do we have to accomplish? You know, what are we going to accomplish as we're in this uh, still kind of uh, quarantine, these unique times? Because uh, this is times, this is time we need to use, redeem and use for the sake of another. Um, and then we've studied Colossians. Um, and let's say, for instance, the opportunity comes up to study Colossians again next year. Do it. I mean, this is, this is what I'm trying to say is that we don't now check Colossians off our list. Um, we don't say, well, I don't need to read that anymore. anymore or, or when you come to the next opportunity to read it or study it to just say, well, you know, I already did that. We're done. You know, it's, it's the infinite text that we approach again and again. And like I said, I've been in Colossians chapter two probably the most. Uh, of of my ministry that you know it's diving right into chapter two uh, but it still was a, a beautiful uh, journey for me through a chapter that i knew very well um, so the infinite text is something that we should continue to approach the scripture and know that the holy spirit has something there for us um i wanted to uh, show you i think just some word art uh from that colossians chapter four verse six and then uh, i just wanted to close our time here with um, I'm going to share a window here. I get the so hopefully your window will start to change the screen. And just to talk shortly about this uh, this question here, right? This is question five of the uh, of the uh, feedback form I sent out to you, which meant a little bit of work on your part. I really appreciate the fact that you took it um, to just go forward with uh, this. So a lot of possibilities here. You know, what does it mean that I'm a part of of being an apostle, being a shaliach, which was that uh, Old Testament understanding of that. Uh, let's see. I think I can also increase the size of this just a little bit. The possibility of developing your understanding of Jesus' divinity. Let's back that. Sorry. And what what a difference it makes to your to an active faith, right? So just spending time that last part of chapter one about all those truths about Jesus. What does that mean? You know, what is it? How do you put each one of those into practice? You know, what does that mean about uh, who Christ is for you? This is this is powerful stuff. Uh, developing your practice to forgiveness, but this one is the one that I'm that I'm holding on to from chapter two. This is this is me uh, to to develop, continue to develop my practice of forgiveness, um, because chapter two has a lot to teach. He chose his struggle. There's a lot there in chapter three. And that should not uh, keep us uh, stuck in uh, 
common, easy, uh, uh, trite responses uh, to scripture and the relationship between a husband and wife. Um, there's a lot more going on there. Uh, develop an action plan for current issues surrounding slavery based on the deeper understanding of slavery and slavery and master texts. This, this is something that's very timely, uh, very appropriate uh, to the discussions going on in our uh, public square right now. Actively pursue a prayer, prayer life that develops based on chapter four. They had some really cool uh, pictures of that. Some of you have chosen that. Um, prayer life, I see four, four people have chosen that. And um, a lot of you chose to deepen your understanding of the apostle and Shaliyah. Uh, one of you chose to develop your understanding of Jesus' divinity. Uh, those phrases that, that him, last part of chapter one, uh, powerful place to be. Let's see another one of you is going to be joining me on that journey. Uh, practice of forgiveness. Uh, developing an action plan for current issues surrounding slavery based on, so this, this one, this person here is going to be uh, developing uh, that conversation happening in our world right now. Um, I think maybe I have to go back to the platform for, to do what I want to do here. And I wonder if there's a way for me to do that. Let's see if I can go ahead and let's see if I show. Yeah, so I'm starting to see some of your action steps. That's not what I wanted to do. I want to go back to the questions and talk just a little bit about those um, action steps. Hmm. That's strange. I think I still need to. Sorry, one more, one more thing here. Hi. Preview. Thank you. <laughs> I guess that's what I thought I was doing. Is to say, um, what can we, where can we take this to? No, it's going to make me do this. <laughs> Joe Schmo, that's Joe Schmo's uh, program. Wait, it doesn't really work. That's probably just still, yeah. Okay, all my, all my, great, I'm going to do that now. Is this, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Let me just um, go ahead and leave this and stop sharing. I just want to, I wanted to talk through um, what I wrote in that next section, just to say, okay, where, where, where can we go with this? And I want, to, I want you to think about a couple of things. Who's in your circles? Um, what can you do on social media that's actually going to be effective? Uh, what conversation does God have ahead for you? You know, as we start to come back together with people, he's going to start putting you back together with people who have been um, spending a lot of time in isolation. Um, spending time that may have made them angrier um, or more polarized. Um, people I've noticed are a lot more um, impatient. Uh, their, their anger is much more on the surface. And so we have, we have um, connections to make. We have uh, patience, patient and listening ears to have. We have uh, encouragement to give. And certainly we have a, a master in heaven um, who's got us covered, who has our lives in his hands um, and certainly is not going to let go. Uh, not, 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 in a, not in a way that should leave us with anything else but joy, right? That final prayer request of those verses I read in the first part of chapter one, that we endure the difficult uh, with joy. So um, I think really, I think I'm going to uh, wrap it up with just uh, see if there's any Final questions because, um, well, we made it through uh, that uh, that section much quicker than I thought. Uh, like I said, I'm very much in this time zone and I'm running out of juice a little faster than I would, but I'm going to just uh, see if there's any final closing questions before we uh, have a closing prayer. I'll be following up with you individually too about your plans. Thank you for sharing sharing that. Think. Yeah, so I don't remember if I put any art. I did. So it's just a, a picture of the Word of God as, a, as that living, active Word of God, even though I think they're using German in the uh, <laughs> calligraphy there.
So any closing questions from you all who've uh, hung with me this uh, whole journey through Colossians? Looks like we didn't have my mom and Mary, Mary Mason. She made it to every other one. So hats off to Mary Drew. Wayne. Mm -hmm. Hey, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you for this. Um, you made Colossians come to life, truly. I mean, as to a guy like me that, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> believe in the Lord and all that, but that, you know, that, those four chapters and that short, short, um, uh, book, uh, you, you made it come to life and, and I'm thankful for that. So, well, yeah. It's very cool that your feet walked very near to Colossae. Yeah. And, uh, and it's neat to, neat to just see, I guess, for me, uh, that, that history that, uh, that you were very close to. Um, so yeah, it's been a good journey for me too. Thanks, Wayne. Any other closing questions or comments before we, uh, the, the one that I would make a comment is. on pastor is, uh, the section where to grow more in prayer, uh, the prayer one. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, you know, you can say a lot of prayers, but I think a lot of times it's not always thought to give thanksgiving for just being where you are at that, at that time. So studying yeah. more, studying more on that. And like Wayne said, you know, it just kind of adds to, you know, we haven't traveled over there in their instance, but um, mm -hmm. just being able to bring it to a better perspective for us to have an understanding of what was going on at that time. I, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I just thought it was really neat to see just the amount of people surrounding this letter, all the relationships and um, it, I'm, I've studied it before, but just, had lost a lot of that. And the fact that Timothy and Paul were writing it together and there were so many relationships built into it just really struck home for me. Just, you know, it, <laughs> maybe uh, it's, it's acceptable in this case to say it does take a village, you know, to, uh, to talk about faith with, with people. Yeah, so those first four verses of chapter four, Debbie, yeah, lots, lots right there, just right there uh, about prayer. All right. Well, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> so I, why, don't, why don't we come back on if you have the if you have the video capabilities? Let's go ahead and crash this thing. So I can at least see you all before we go, and then we'll close in prayer. So go ahead and start your video back up. If you are on a, a PC, you can press Control E. Yep. Hey Debbie. And uh, you know we might start we might start moving around in really slow frames, but that's okay. It's good to. Good to see everybody if you want to bring your videos back on and then we'll close in prayer thanks for helping us uh everybody all your comments uh sharing and feedback on these forms i'm going to see you're going to help me for the next class just like what things you saw is the most effective um, so maybe some things that i need to shed that you just didn't see as effective at all so yep, i hear uh, the clerks here Hey, Bonnie. Yep. I can hear you, Mike, but I can't see you. Well, this might be the best we're going to be able to do. There you are. Great. Then we can uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this journey through Colossians. Um, I pray that all of our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit have, 
have journeyed to that time and place, uh, seeing the people there, hearing this letter for the first time, seeing the many hands that were part of its writing and, and giving, and also the response, Lord, that uh, your Holy Spirit would have inspired in them and now inspires in us as we hear this letter. May we, uh, Lord, be changed, uh, called to a deeper life of prayer, called to a better understanding of who you are, Jesus, your divinity, your power over our lives, and also, Lord, just uh, our responses in, in deepening knowledge, but also in actions that reflect your love in this world. So this is a great start, God, one that's just a part of our journey, uh, walking in your footsteps. And so we go forward in your power and your promise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.